Good morning, everyone in Singapore. Uh, we've got something very interesting for you today. We're going to do a little bit of a South African professional uh, Q&A, get to know Billy Bosch today. Um, so, Billy, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Michael. Um, so we're going to just uh, get into the, the questions and answers today, a little bit of an interview uh, to understand a bit about what you're doing here in Singapore. Um, but as a brief introduction to who you are and, and why we're speaking with you today. Um, so Billy works for a uh, company called Dianata, which is a uh, logistics company based out of Dubai, is that correct? Yeah, our headquarters is, is there, yes. Great, and um, they, they've been tasked with the massive, enormous task of helping with the uh, logistics and distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine um, and throughout Singapore. So I think it's very timely that we speak to Billy today about all of this. Um, so I think let's start with a little bit about you and, and your background. Can you tell us about where did you grow up um, and how did you end up here and that sort of thing? All right, well, um, I'm a farm boy, so all the way from um, Robertson in, in the Boerland wine farm region. Um, I studied uh, marketing and business comms at the North Northwest University, or the old Potch. Um, I was there for four years, and then um, that was my first job, actually, as well. So I worked in their marketing and comms um, department for another three years, which is, yeah, quite Quite interesting and um, yeah from there I've had a few sort of international roles as well I made it to the UK for a bit um, before Singapore I was in in Qatar which is quite quite different to, to Singapore so um, yeah I've, I've, I've been sort of privileged to to be able to travel for work quite a lot and, and see see a lot of the world well so um, I think people who quite a few South Africans I speak to that end up here they usually start the journey of going off to the the UK and then they find they hate uh, the weather um, and eventually uh, move to sunnier places so was that the case with you? Yeah, yeah it was uh, you know they had this um, two-year working holiday visa right so that was sort of the the start of the the, the process to, and then you're like a shark that smells blood if you just start traveling um uh, that was actually like like one of the hobbies and things that make me tick as well is is to travel and to explore and working in aviation I'm privileged to to have been able to see a lot of the world um, with my previous employer um, Qatar Airways I traveled quite a lot so at the moment I'm on 65 countries and wow. counting so looking forward for um, for the COVID, um, yeah, the pandemic to sort of quiet down so we can sort of resume our normal normal activities. So, yeah. Yeah, and, I, think, um, I think all of us are looking forward to those days, just uh, getting <laughs> back on an airplane and being able to actually, now that we're in Singapore, be able to go to Bali or Thailand or whatever. It's just, it's, it's yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, what brought me to Singapore was um, one of my colleagues actually from Qatar Airways started um, working here at Dinata and sort of brought me in. So it was initially just a, a contract role, which has then turned into permanent. And now it's yeah, two and a half years later. So yeah, time flies. <laughs> sure. And um, would you say that Singapore is one of the, the nicer places that you've lived? Have you enjoyed your experience of being here so far? Absolutely. I think Singapore is very easy. There's not a, a language barrier, really. Um, everything works. Everything is clean. I mean, I'm personally a fan of the of the good weather as well. And then, of course, it's a really good base to travel from as well. So um, some of the challenges that I experienced, for instance, in the Middle East um, is, is not really something that you face here. So I think um, from an expat point of view, Singapore is actually pretty good. Yeah, and I, I hear that quite a lot, actually. I, I spoke with someone the other day who worked in Saudi Arabia and they moved down here and they just said, this is just so much easier to live here. And for me, having worked in China, moving here is just, a, it's a breeze. You know, there's no language barriers, as you say, and it's just easy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's a really that's nice um, segue into your your journey here in with Dianata and your, your role and... Could you tell us a bit about like your responsibilities and what you do? 
Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll start just to, to give some background on the NATA as well. So we're part of the Emirates Group. So as you rightfully said, our headquarters are in Dubai. So the company has been around for over 60 years and we're one of the world's largest air services providers. So we're covering more than 126 uh, airports across six continents. Wow. So a airlines are essentially our customers. So once they land, for instance, here in Singapore, then we take over. So we do the, the ramp, the towing of the aircraft, um, the baggage handling, um, the customer services. So for instance, um, a lot of the airline stuff that you would see when you check in usually is usually our staff in the airline's uniform. <laughs> so, and then when they need, they need to check in for another airline, they might need to go and change and then come in in a different uniform. So, um, and it's also cheaper for the airlines then to outsource that as well um, and to have locals, or then to have local staff here, right? So, um, yeah, on top of that, we also do the cargo handling, which we will go into a little bit more today, and um, the catering as well. So, the food that you receive on the airlines that fly out from here is could likely come from our um, catering kitchens. Wow. So, so geez, he does do everything, really. I mean, some of, but I must say, every Emirates flight I've ever had, the food has been good. I'm glad to. <laughs> um, then, yeah, where my role comes in, so as marketing and comms manager, so I'm involved um, in all the projects covering internal and external comms across all these business units that I've just mentioned to you now. And um, I'm, I include the or support the operations, not just in Singapore, but regionally as well. So that covers at the moment, Australia, Indonesia and the Philippines. And then um, a, a few others coming up as well um, as we expand across the region. So never a dull moment. It sounds really stressful. I can imagine, I mean, the communications for one specific area is going to be different to the other. So, I mean, what we're saying in Singapore is going to be different in the Philippines and different in Jakarta and Indonesia and all of that. So, so you, you, when do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> like you said earlier, yeah, I'm developing like an extra pair of arms and an extra head here as well. So, but um, yeah, I mean, really enjoying it. It's, 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 been, it's been quite the, the pleasant journey. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so I, I guess let's move into 2020. Yes, it's behind us, but COVID-19 is not quite just there yet. Um, so what were some of the main things that you took away from 2020, um, you know, from working through the COVID-19 pandemic? How did it affect your work? The adjustments, uh, lessons learned, difficulties? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, looking back now, it's, it's almost a year, right? So um, when I look back, I think one of the things that just stood out for me and, and in terms of lessons learned was in the beginning, I don't know if you remember um, when they were just uh, like in Singapore announcing the COVID cases. So they would go and announce the person's name and also where they worked. <laughs> um, and, and our company was one of those that we had a, um, a staff member that, that traveled and came back and then was identified. And that was in the beginning of the, the pandemic where people didn't really know, you didn't know exactly how, how bad this is. Um, and, and it was still so, uh, sort of a, a large fear factor there, right? So um, that was quite interesting just to handle all the comms like internally, externally as well. And um, a lesson learned for me was just the importance of a business continuity plan. Um, because luckily we had that in place. Um, we had our meetings, everything was ready on paper. So when that situation came up, we just um, had to action then. So from the split teams, the, the deep cleaning of the facilities, the um, we even took the initiative of um, issuing a few stay of home notices just internally as a precaution, just to, to make sure that we safeguard our staff. So um, yeah, that's sort of one of the lessons that, that we learned. And I think we handled it well and, and everything was fine. But um, yeah, it's quite a shock in the system when, when it's something that you, you prepare for on paper, but then when it happens in reality, um, that's quite a different story. Yeah. Um, as, uh, as aviation is considered um, essential services as well. So um, for me personally, uh, right after Circuit Breaker, I, I had to come back to the office. So I can't really give you much feedback or tips on, on working from home. That's a long distance memory for me. <laughs> um, but talking about aviation in general, I mean, I think it's, it's fairly common knowledge that 
passenger traffic has been affected quite quite significantly and it reflects in our business as well um although cargo has been sort of the backbone and and, and been really really um, busy we had to adapt a lot of the way we um we do things obviously with the safe distancing and the the sort of um, protection of our staff and then our customers as well but then also new operating procedures for instance um, a lot of airlines converted their um, passenger aircraft where they would then transport in cargo so we were supporting carrying physically carrying the cargo in the cabins and you need to make sure that you don't um, sort of ruin the seats you need to make sure that the boxes are all secured when they take off so I mean, it's, it's, it's new for us as well. Um, and we were helping and working with our airline partners as well is just writing those standard operating um, procedures as well when it comes to um, cargo loading um, inside the cabin. Well, I mean, look, everyone's all, the industries that were hardest hit last year were definitely mm -hmm. aviation, leisure, uh, anyone in travel really. So, I mean, the fact that they were adapt or die, they had to, right? Um, yeah. You guys exactly. were a part of helping those airlines in their survival. Yeah, kind of exactly. Exactly. And even for, for us as a, as, a, as a company as well, I mean, we've had challenges like many other companies as well, where we had to right size our company. Um, we unfortunately uh, had to say goodbye to, to some really valuable um, colleagues. Um, but um, we have really, really focused on, on upskilling and, and um, redeploying our staff as well. And luckily with the Singapore government being so supportive as well, we've been um, sort of supporting a lot of government projects and we've been redeploying a lot of our staff to help other companies in need of um, or a manpower shortage for specific roles that's COVID related, for instance, um, COVID ambassadors. So thanks to these redeployment um, sort of initiatives, we can still um, retain these staff on our payroll and um, we don't lose these specialized skills because when the um, aviation picks up again, I mean, you, you, you need those people, right? So um, we've been lucky in terms of sort of managing that. Um, and then of course, like what many other companies have done as well is over the past year, we've moved towards sort of um, digital, um, a lot of e-learning and also just looking at how we were doing things and um, evaluating our processes, introducing more um, automation and then also introducing new services as well. So it is a matter of the companies that, that adapt is the ones that's going to survive. So you can't just sit still um, during the pandemic and wait for it to be over, right? Yeah, I mean, look, much the same in the work that I do. We had to find new ways to engage with, with, with customers and clients and make our process as easy to deal with as possible so that people want to actually proceed and do business with you. Because if, mm. when things are chunky and there's too many back and forths and it's just not a, a streamlined process, people lose interest. So I think the, the, that's actually a common trend across many businesses where we're seeing them shifting across into you know dig, digitalization, as they call it now. Mm. Um, and COVID just put that on the fast track. So I do think, mm. I mean, it's a, it was a necessary evil. It's sad that we had to mm. come to this point for us to adapt to this level, but um, we have. Um, mm. So I, I think that that brings us into the massive undertaking that Dianata and, and your team is basically doing at the moment and the role that you guys are playing in Singapore with the distribution of the, the vaccines. Um, could you tell us a little bit uh, about uh, that? Yes, absolutely. So um, like I referred to earlier, so since the start of the pandemic, um, air cargo has really transported millions of personal protective gear, pharmaceuticals and perishables, because um, I think many of you know that like in your passenger aircraft in the belly, it not only carries your baggage, but also cargo, yeah. um, like supplies, perishables, all of that. So with the passenger planes then not going and carrying passengers, um, it didn't stop um, cargo from, from, or air cargo from continuing and actually transferring all these valuable um, items. Now, um, with the, the importance of air cargo as well, it's become very crucial for airlines to be supported by accredited ground handlers like Tanata to ensure that when um, the life-saving vaccines come through the air cargo um, 
supply chain that you're supported um, and it's it's handled properly. And for Donata globally, that's been one of our sort of big focuses as well over the past year is, is the preparation for it as well. Mm. Um, one thing that I that I have to mention is handling vaccines is not a new thing for us. Um, we've been handling vaccines for years. It is just to ramp up now for the sheer scale of this. Um, many, many people in the industry has referred to the distribution of the vaccines as probably air cargo's uh, the biggest logistical challenge for the century, if not ever. Um, and what we've been doing as a company is just um, focusing on investing in our processes and our equipment, um, our industry certification, um, partnerships and industry memberships, just to ensure that we offer the best in class service to our customers. Um, to get back to, to Singapore specifically, so we've got a state-of-the-art um, cool chain facility, which is about like 1,400 square meters. Um, and in there, um, it's temperature controlled rooms that can go to minus 25 degrees and it's modular as well. So um, to ensure now the uncompromised sort of un integrity of the pharmaceutical handling in this whole supply chain, um, we invested in manufacturing cool dollies. So the cool dollies, we were the first to introduce it in the Singapore market. So it's almost like an ice cream truck <laughs> that sort of drives, drives on the tarmac. Um, so, so basically um, what we've done is we identified risks and that's, that's our role in the supply chain as well. And uh, uh, one risk that's been identified is, if I can sort of just go and, and talk you through the whole process. So a vaccine now, when it's manufactured um, in, in the, um, the facilities, it then gets, it needs to be distributed, right? So on an aircraft, the pilot can, can control the temperature. And also it's usually in uh, sort of a proper packaging as well. But then when it arrives at an, at an um, airport, let's use Shanghai as an example. In the Singapore weather, I mean, it can go easily go to like 35 degrees uh, midday. And then at some points at the terminals, it, the journey from an once the um, cargo has been offloaded from the aircraft, the journey in that heat to the facilities then, the cool facilities, can take up to like 45 minutes. And the big thing is that we just wanna make sure that the vaccine is not compromised um, during the handling and that there's not um, temperature fluctuations as well. And that's where we come in um, to try and help where we, where we can when we um, handle the vaccines. And that's why we invested in these cool dollies as well. So then when the um, cargo gets offloaded, it goes directly into these cool dollies and then it goes to our storage facilities where it then awaits for the um, sort of the next phase in this logistics, which is then the um, goes to, let's say to the hospitals or to where it gets stored further then. So typically in our facilities, it's not a, a long-term storage facility, but we help maintain that um, sort of temperature control um, while it's within our hand. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, um, we are working, we are part of the task force here at um, Changi Airport as well. So, I mean, as you know, it's coming in, in batches in Singapore at the moment, but like worldwide, these vaccines are now in demand. So it's as, as they ramp up production as well, it'll become more sort of available to different countries as well. So what we're doing now is also working um, with the airport to position Singapore because of our facilities and accreditation and the way um, that we can handle this is to become a hub for the rest of the region as well because across the region there's not necessarily all these facilities um, to be able to 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 handle properly so we are looking at sort of playing a more integral role across the, the region as well for this. Wow uh, <laughs> there's no no small task ahead and I mean without you this, no. this probably wouldn't be Sure, it, it could probably be done, but it would have to be a company like yours that has all these procedures in place to ensure that when it gets off the plane, it doesn't get too hot and then we can't use it. And then exactly it just right. delays the whole process of the rolling out the, the distribution of it. Um, yeah, exactly. So I guess that, that kind of covers off the Dianata role with the COVID. Um, now, uh, I would also like to hear about this, your your views about the um, vaccine having to you, 
you took it recently and you look perfectly fine yes. to me. So um, could you, I don't know, share some myth busting or anything like that with us? Yeah, um, uh, let me just be clear, just to state, like, I'm no medical professional, right? So um, all that I'm going to share with you is sort of um, uh, sort of common facts that's out there and um, what the local government has been sharing with us in the aviation community as well. So um, cool. as, as you know, like these batches of, are now arriving in Singapore um, sort of over, over the, the following months. Um, and... In Singapore, what they're focusing on now is the, the people at greater risk. So they've started with the healthcare workers and then they identified um, aviation and maritime workers, which I'm part of as well, as the sort of frontliners. Um, and that's why they've had this, this, this big role at, um, at the airport as well. And then, of course, it's going to the more vulnerable um, communities like the elderly at the moment. Um, what we know at the moment is that vaccination is voluntary. They're not they're strongly encouraging it. Um, Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine is the only one that's approved so far. So that's the only one that, that is being um, distributed. Um, at the moment, like on, on um, radio this morning, they were saying it's, it's over 113,000 people has been vaccinated in Singapore so far. Um, out of that, they've only noted three significant side effects of people that had side effects. And those are people with a history of um, allergies. Um, but for me personally, like I, I had to get a tetanus shot um, end of last year. And for me that, that burned more. And I, I felt that the next day a little bit more than the COVID vaccine. It was actually, um, it's a very thin needle as well. Um, the process is very sort of streamlined as well. Um, they, they give you your sort of briefing. Um, it's very well organized. I mean, as you would expect from, from Singapore. Um, the, <laughs> the nurses have got their, their stations as well. And then once you're done, it's a 30 minute sort of observation. So you sort of wait in a sort of a waiting area. And then as you leave, they immediately also confirm your um, appointment for the, for the next session because um, the Pfizer vaccine, obviously you need, you need to do in two doses. Oh, okay. um, for, for the purpose of, of this discussion, I've sort of taken the liberty of just summarizing like some of the points that I found interesting because we had to share it with our staff as well. Um, yeah. And like I said, these are facts um, out there, but I've sort of taken the liberty of just making like a short few summary points of, of the facts that they highlighted to also just give people some peace of mind um, when taking this as well. Sure. So... Um, at the moment from, or as from end of last year, the World Health Organization listed 52 vaccine candidates actually out there. And then um, there's 163 in preclinical studies. Oh. Um, some people are criticizing the vaccines that's approved at the moment because of the shortened time frame compared to other vaccines. And they're questioning sort of how can you be sure that scientific um, rigor has not been compromised. Yeah. So some of the reasons that's been shared to give people that peace of mind is the accelerated development timeline was possible given the significant investment and dedication of resources. The mRNA technology platform they've been using to develop this, it's already been out there for years prior to the pandemic. So right. that, that was sort of a, a stepping stone. Um, then, obviously, thanks to strong global partnerships between many partners, including international organizations, governments, um, and the recruitment um, for and the conduct of controlled trials um, has, has been sort of done more quicker um, than in the absence of the pandemic. And then they've done many trials um, concurrently, which allowed them for sufficient data to be produced in a shorter time frame. Sure. So um, what the government has shared as well is that the safety and scientific integrity has not been compromised and no shortcuts has been made. Um, then some people were, were questioning, would a single dose be sufficient sure. or not? So um, based on the uh, research for the Pfizer one specifically, that they've said that um, they've not formally um, studied the efficacy of a single dose. But what they've seen from phase three trials is it's about 50%. 
but the current trials do not provide enough information to, to talk about the durability of the protection based on a single dose only. Sure. Um, some people have also asked like if, as you know, like some, some other brands might be um, approved. So they were saying like, can I get a, a dose from one brand and then sort of swap over and do the other one? Um, and uh, the feedback has been like, um, at this time, there's no evidence to support or encourage you to, to switch brands. Um, so yeah, they, they're really not encouraging that at all. Um, and they're just saying here, the ministry will provide more recommendation and follow once there's more data available on studies. Um, if, if a booster is required as well. So they're also telling people to don't get one vaccine and then as soon as the other brand comes out, go and get that as well as a, as a double up. So just, just stick to the one that you have. Um, and I think, yeah, this is the last one that I just wanted to highlight that I found interesting is, um, this is based on the Q&A. They were asking um, how will vaccination after um, the, or how would, how would testing um, be affected once you've been vaccinated? And will the vaccination then generate false positives? So the feedback has been the vaccination will not affect the typical test that they do, that is the PCR and the um, antigen test. So that would not, not affect. Um, but the test for antibodies um, to the spike protein will reflect. So that will be positive after the, the vaccine. So yeah, that's just sort of in a nutshell a few things. I mean, there's a lot of information out there. Um, what I would maybe suggest for, for those guys in Singapore as well is the government has a website and you can actually now pre-register your interest as well to, um, to log if you want the vaccine. So from memory now, I think it's vaccine.gov.sg. Um, um, we can stand, stand to be correction, yeah. yeah. But they they already taken to you um, as of now. You they they only accepting the the sort of elderly, but you can log your um, interest already. It's interesting, and uh, like I'm no expert either. But in in my personal view, I don't think um, in recent times there has been another event that has literally stopped the world in its tracks and all governments around the world had to come up with a solution to get their economies up and going again and. I think that's enough of an incentive to put as much money, research, um, professionals into one space and just go, please fix this, do, do what you mm. can. You're seeing into lots of intergovernment um, between let's say the US and the UK, for example, sharing their information and the development of the Oxford um, vaccines and, and research they did over there was mm. instrumental in the development to other vaccines as well. So. I think the sharing of resources, as you said, is one of the greatest things that hasn't really been done with yeah. other, other diseases before, you know? Um, like, yeah. Yeah. We're not experts. That's our personal view. My personal view is that I would take it. Um, and we're not telling the audience to do that, but be informed from the right places and uh, exactly. at your own discretion. Mm. And, and yeah, we're hoping, I mean, from, for me personally as well, is I'm, I'm hoping that by, by doing that as well is maybe putting ourselves, I mean, as expats that sort of far away from, from other families um, and friends as well, that maybe getting the vaccine could also be that stepping stone to easier traveling in future. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed, watch this space. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm, I mean, going through Christmas and not being able to see family um, and all of that. It was a difficult time for many expats stuck over here, particularly those who are living here by themselves. Um, so obviously, uh, the sooner this is over, the, the sooner we can get back to seeing our loved ones and everything being a little bit better. Um, yeah, I, from, from my side, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. It's been lovely chatting to you. Sure. And um, yeah, get, looking forward to just having the local society sort of open a little bit more so we can be a bit more social, see a bit more, more people, more friends, and then, yeah, just to network a little bit um, with more of the fellow members of the chamber as well. Yeah, awesome. Well, th thank you very much, Billy. And um, look, um, the chamber is, is rolling out these interviews with uh, as, as many professionals, South African professionals in Singapore as we can to bring interesting information to the community and add value in any way that we can in these difficult times where, as we say, it's difficult to network and do the other functions of a chamber. So thank you very much for being a part of that and, and contributing. It's, I really appreciate it. And um, 
yeah, I look forward to seeing you again uh, offline. All right. Take care. Thank you.